Well, good morning, everyone. I like it when people's talking a lot. That's what church is about. Let's stand and worship, though. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging seas, my God still holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. You're glad they're here with us this morning. hid this. This is as long as I could get by with it because he figured it out. So. It's just because I knew he was giving it to her. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So before I even do announcements, 
because I really do want to know, like, did anybody do the challenge that I gave them last week? Oh, <laughs> sort of. My mom, like, didn't even do it. Um, <laughs> that's all good. Um, all right, not very many people. I'm a little disappointed. Um, so now we're going to redo it that this week. You guys have to read your Bibles as soon as you get up. The only thing you can do before you get up, before you read your Bible, is go pee. That's the only thing. <laughs> Nothing else. Okay, so we're retrying, redo. And um, so at 3 p.m. today is the pavilion dedication and um, potluck meal. And we're bringing the meat, but we would encourage everyone to bring a side to share with people. So that is at 3 today. And then... On Wednesdays at 7 p.m. starting September 14th, not this Wednesday, um, is Emotionally Healthy Women and Miss Becca is going to be doing it. And so if you have any questions about it, you can go see Miss Becca. And also there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. But it does not start till September 14th. And then um, we have Passion and Prayer. And for the next four weeks, we're going to be doing it with Mr. Richard Wright. And it's going to be on the book of Galatians, and it's going to be from 9.30 to 10.15 um, on Sundays. And then there's also a new way to give online, and you can text GIVE to the number that's supposed to be on the screen. Um, yeah, right there. You can text GIVE, and you can give online now. All right. So not this summer, but last summer, my mom did swim lessons, and I helped out well because I can swim. And um, so she did swim lessons, and she would do it with, like, sibling groups sometimes. And one of the kids would get in, and they would go to my mom. And for some reason, I always got stuck with the kids who would not let go of the edge. It was a little sad. And I would have the kickboard, and I'd be like, all right, now we're going to swim. Like, these are swim lessons. And they'd be like, I'm not scared, but I'm just going to stand here for a minute. And I'd be like, okay, well, we need to start. And they'd be like, well, I'm not scared. They would tell me, I'm not scared. I'm really not scared. And I'd be like, yes, you are scared. Please let go of the wall. And um, they would do this for an awfully long time, and I feel like it was kind of a waste of time. But um, I feel like we do this with faith sometimes. In James 2.18, it says, now someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. And I think um, if we want to please God, we have to show him we have faith by our actions. We're standing there and we're like, oh, I have faith, I have faith. Well, show me you have faith. And um, I think that we have to have an active faith. And a lot of people say they have faith, and they don't have faith. They have a dead faith. And um, we may not always know where we're going, but we know the person who is guiding us is God. So sometimes we just have to let go of the wall and take a leap of faith and put our trust into God's. Amen. Thank you, Lindsay. Well, as we get ready for prayer time this morning, I just received a text message from this half of the room over here <laughs> uh, that Caden, uh, uh, who is uh, Mildred Campbell's grandson, just tested positive for COVID. So uh, we're, that's one of the reasons we're missing that side over there. So we want to pray for them and pray for the family as, of course, you know, usually it kind of spreads around in among the family that have been near to each other. So uh, are there any other prayer requests as we go into prayer this morning? Pastor Hammond? Okay. Yeah, okay. Jasper has pneumonia. Yeah. Right? Yes. Absolutely. Pray for them and the Holland family. Any other prayer requests this morning? Scott, my mom is uh, she's doing a lot better, but she's just still in so much pain. She can't yeah. get up. Uh, we drill her a lot. She was getting some relief, so she can start working more with sports being mobile. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We pray for Alice. Absolutely. 
Any other prayer requests this morning? Pastor Hammond needs prayer. His blood pressure was 240 over 110 this morning. So we need to pray that uh, that'll drop down very quickly. Mark? George? Okay, absolutely. We'll pray. All right, and just continue to remember, remember uh, you know, members of our church that aren't able to be here with us, Becky and Leonard Lanthrum, continued prayers, and uh, Gloria Hall, I saw her, at, she's at the same nursing home that uh, Alice Christman is, she just got moved there about a, uh, a month ago, so she needs prayer, just to learning to adjust from independent living for 89 years now to a nursing facility, that's a, that's a big adjustment, no doubt, um, so can you continue prayer for her, so... Well, let's begin this morning in prayer by the Lord's Prayer, and uh, would you pray with me this morning? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day and our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive those who have debted against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus, we just thank you uh, this morning that we can come into your, your presence, Lord Jesus. As your presence was here, you were waiting on us, Lord Jesus. You were waiting for us to recognize your presence. And Lord, this morning as we enter into your presence, Father, we ask that, Lord, that you would be gracious to these many requests that we have brought to you today. Father, we pray uh, specifically, Lord Jesus, um, for many requests, Becky and Leonard Lanthrum, Lord, for Caden, who was just diagnosed with COVID, Lord, that you would stretch out your hands to the whole family, Lord God. I pray that the COVID wouldn't spread around them all that had been in contact with Caden, but Lord, that, uh, Father, that your hand would be upon them and that you'd be gracious to them, Lord, and they would recover quickly. We ask this in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for Alice Chrisman, that you would touch her. Gloria Hall, Lord God, uh, Father, alleviate the pain that they're in. And just renew their bodies, minds, and spirit, Lord Jesus, that you would be gracious to them in all these things, Father, we pray. Lord, we thank you that Tim is doing well and had hardly any pain. We give you praise for that, Father. We pray that you would continue to renew his body and mind, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray for the Holland family, Lord Jesus, as they lost uh, this man, Father, that you would be with them and give them grace abundantly, Lord. Uh, touch, Father God, uh, uh, Brother Robert uh, Cable as he preaches the service tomorrow and that your hand uh, of anointing would be with him, Lord Jesus, and that you would season his words with salt and healing, Lord God, and be gracious to that family, uh, Lord, throughout this time. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, Mark's classmate, George, that you would bring healing to his body with this, struggling with this cancer now that is... Uh, come to his body, Lord, I pray that you bring healing to him, that treatment be powerful and effective to him, Father. Lord, we pray for Jasper Curtis this morning, that you would uh, touch his body, touch his lungs, Lord God, and rid his lungs, Lord Jesus, for all that pneumonia, and that you be with him this morning, Father God. We pray for Pastor Hammond, also, Lord, that you would renew his body, uh, regulate, Lord Jesus, his blood pressures, and Father, that there would be no danger of a stroke or anything else in the future. Lord God, we ask in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just pray this morning that you would be with us and in us, Father God. We pray that your presence would be realized among all these things, Father. And Lord, that you would anoint us, uh, Father, to, to see in your word everything that you would have us to know. Lord, that we could live this Christian life effectively and fully, Lord God. We pray that you would show us where to cast our nets, Lord, and fill us with your Holy Spirit this morning. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. And the church said together, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Would you stand? Let's worship the Lord this morning. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence 
I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus
Jesus Christ. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you that we can come into this place today and be surrounded by others. Others that you love. Others that felt called to be here for some reason. Lord, help us to open our hearts to receive the word that you would have for us today. Lord, we know you have the word. Help us to receive it. Lord, help us to put ourselves out of the way and to open our mind and open our heart. We love you and thank you so much. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Can we have all kids come up? We're getting ready for children's church this morning. And we'll pray for you as you get ready to head out. Would you stretch out your hands to our children this morning? Father, we just pray that you would bless and anoint our children, Father, as they are discipled in truth and in your way, that they would walk in your ways all the days of their life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That song is a great song. It, it jogs my memory uh, that one of my professors at Southeastern was uh, he came to saving faith because he was sitting down eating a meal by himself in a restaurant one day and looked over and there was an older man that stopped and prayed before he ate his meal. And that's why he came to the Lord. Amen. Something as simple as invoking the presence and remembering the presence of God before you eat at a restaurant. You know? yeah. Isn't that incredible? Amen. Hopefully the the Lord can be seen in all of us. And that is essentially what we've been talking about to a large degree. This is the final part of my series, the summer series, The Culture of Goodness. And uh, I want this, this series, you know, today especially, to be kind of like the magnum opus or the cream de resistance of the entire series. So um, I want to open this final sermon and I want to tell you an illustration that both applies to the sermon series as a whole, but is basically the central message of this particular sermon. And, and the way that I want to do this, and, and you'll have to check with me here for a moment. Um, if you've never seen the movie, the Leo Di DiCaprio movie in 2010 called Inception, anybody see that film before? It's written by actually who I would consider to be a large philosopher of our time. Um, and uh, he's a director as well as the, he, he's done several movies, but they always have this kind of deep philosophical part to them. And, and I call this, or I, I postulated, if you will, the, a theory of preaching called inception. That there is a possibility that you could have inception. Basically the inception of this idea at the grassroots level of who you are. And so in the movie, in the film Inception, Leo DiCaprio is a Leonardo DiCaprio. That's his name. Uh, is a thief, but he's not a normal thief. He's a thief that steals intellectual, you know, thoughts, and he can plant thoughts in people's minds and stuff like that through their dreams. I know it's a bit of a stretch, but you get just track with me here, okay, for a second. In their unconscious, he goes into their dreams, and then they have a dream, but then he postulates this theory of inception, meaning that you could actually have an original thought put into somebody's mind. But you got to go within a dream, within a dream, and within a dream. And down there at the bottom of it is the core of human nature. Somehow you could insert this thought into the core of the person. So my preaching theory of inception is, is that I could tell you a story within a story within a story. And somehow at the deepest level of who you are, all three of those stories, when I give you a little kick and you come back up and you wake to consciousness as I apply the stories, all three of them apply the same exact way, and then suddenly you're like, man, I got it. I got it. And it affects the deepest core of your ideology and what you believe about yourself and the world. I know it's a bit of a stretch, but just check with me. I'm going to try it now uh, to have inception or the preaching theory of inception. You heard it here first, by the way. If somebody else writes a book on this. Uh, please let me know. I need to get credit for that. Um, the first layer, if you will, the first dream or the first uh, story is the scriptural narrative. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Yeah. Hebrews 2 verse 1 says this. We must pay attention. 
the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we may not drift away. That's, that's pretty big right there. To what we have heard so that we may not drift away. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 20 says this. Be very careful. Hear the same sort of warning. Then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. Anybody know the days are evil? Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to indecency, debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, and make music. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would drive your word deep into our hearts this morning, that you would allow us to see, to understand, and to know how to live this Christian life. Lord, be with us, Father, as we look into your word. Let it live to us. Let it be alive and awaken our souls this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So you have the first layer, which is the scriptural narrative. The second layer down would be this story. It goes like this. Uh, You've probably heard me say it to more. It's probably my favorite story to tell. But I was standing out in the foyer one time after church, and Gary Toole was standing with me. And I was speaking to Gary Toole, and William came up next to me, uh, my middle son. And he was littler at that time, just about the height that his little shaved summer head uh, was, you know, I could kind of rub his head with my hand. Anybody remember doing that with your sons or when they were little or whatnot? And you just sit there and you rub his head and he's hanging onto my leg and then somebody called me away and he, William wasn't paying any attention whatsoever. And so naturally and normally, Gary has sons and uh, William was still standing there. I had walked away and William kind of gravitated right over there to Gary Toole, not knowing that it wasn't me. I'm standing across the room watching all this go down. William is leaning against Gary's leg, and very naturally, Gary's hand reaches down and starts rubbing his little bald, you know, shaved head. And, and uh, it was so normal and so natural that William had no clue that I wasn't standing there. I'm across the room watching this all go down, and as I watched this, and then William was suddenly awakened to the fact that it wasn't me that was rubbing his head. Wasn't my leg that he was leaning against? I was jogged into memory of a situation that was similar in my own life. This is the third layer deep, fellas. We're all we're almost there, okay? When I was a kid, I remember my mom going into the mall. She had to get something very quickly, and I remember she saying, looking back at me, she said, "You better keep up. Stay right behind me." And so I followed her into the mall, and she was rushing through one of the department stores, and I got distracted by something, as you could imagine, as a child. Looking around, I thought I saw my mom, the dark brunette hair with her coat on. It looked just like her. Everybody had the same, same coat in the 90s, by the way, you know, long jacket, you know, parka or something like that in wintertime. Somewhere in northern Kentucky, we were at the mall. And so I had followed who I thought was my mom, and finally uh, I was trekking with her, as catching up to her as best as I can. She went down the main hallway, out the department store, and then she turned right, and all of a sudden I saw the profile of the woman that I was following, and it wasn't my mom. At that moment in time, I felt exactly what William felt when he looked up and he didn't see me. He saw Gary Toole. The feeling was that of being totally and utterly lost because you were following somebody that you thought was someone else. Yes, sir. And here the application is this, that as we come back, if I give you the kick, the application to all these layers of Scripture, be very careful who you are following. Amen. Scripture says that Satan walks around masquerading as an angel of light. Right. It's easy if you only see part of them to follow the wrong way. And if in our days, if in our times, we need to know that we're following the true Jesus, yeah. the real Jesus, it's these days. It's these days. Remember that Jesus said, he said, in the last days, they'll be calling out, oh, here's the Messiah. Oh, there's the Messiah. Look over here. Look yeah. over there. Yeah. But know that this will all happen before the great and coming day of the Lord Glory. Jesus Christ. Pay attention. Yes, Focus. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. That's what is so important. 
The scripture says we must pay attention, most careful attention, therefore, to what you have heard, so you do not drift away. Be very careful, then, how you live. I was meditating on this the other day, thinking about the enemy and how he works and how Satan does things in life and how things in these days seem to be evil and increasingly evil every moment. And uh, it's been said for many years that idle hands are the devil's playground. Anybody ever heard that before? And then I thought about that for a while, and it's, I heard another one often said in church, which is that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy so you don't have any time for the Lord. So whether you have nothing to do or you have a whole lot to do, guess what? The devil's after you either way. I mean, that's the point, I think, that I grasp here. And I think we do well to pay attention to how we're living and what's going on in life so we can recognize the spiritual nature of the world around us. I know that for the Western Christians, we don't get this very often, but go to countries like Africa, South America, uh, uh, anywhere in the third world, basically. Asia, certain parts of Asia, overwhelmingly. The spiritual nature that surrounds people is so present. But we probably shroud it and hide it and many other things. You know, it looks a lot better in the United States than the real truth of the spiritual nature of the world around us. And so if it's possible, this is what I want this sermon to be, sort of the magnum opus of what it means to create a culture of goodness, to be in a culture of goodness, recognizing that we are in desperate need of the spiritual nature of Jesus Christ as the world goes towards evil, as the world around us is increasingly evil, that we should, in in proportion, or greater proportion, rather, be worried about a culture of goodness here, in this place, and then also as a witness to the world, so they can see Jesus in us. The contrast will become greater over time. However, in the midst of all this, I have to recognize this, that one of the greatest indictments of the Christian church in the United States is that we are best recognized as a political voting block in the United States rather than following the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a sucker punch to the gut of Christianity. That the world looks at us and they say, well, they're conservatives politically. Instead of looking at us and say, those people follow Jesus. And we can make all kinds of terminology and, and assimilations of all how they overlap. And I'm not saying that there's not truth to that. I'm saying that we should be defined by nothing other than the Christ Jesus people. Amen. The followers of Jesus Christ. And as we speak of a culture of goodness, this implies the issues of ethics or right and wrong. If you're going to say anything is good, then you're now speaking of a moral and ethical argument. And as we approach the scripture, we must remember that God is first. In the beginning, God. That's how Genesis starts out. In the beginning, God. The most quoted Psalm 23 starts with, the Lord is my shepherd. Before we get to anything else, it's the Lord. In the beginning, God. The Lord. In the book of John, we see the nearly same as in Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God in the beginning. Before we have any argument of what is good and bad, we must remember that God was first in the beginning, and God was the first good. And so to make any moral argument of good or bad or evil is to presuppose that God is the first good. Anything that is less than God is not good. Anything that is less than God is needing of God's redemption to make it good. And it is possible, it is impossible apart from God to be good. And as we approach this subject, let us remember that Jesus is the beginning and the end. Or as Revelation 1.8 says, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is and he was and he is to come. God was good, God is good, and God is going to be good as he comes to us. And so the question begs, do you really know Jesus? Do you really know the Holy Spirit? 
The Ephesian scripture leads us into this direction of what it is to be in the truly good life. Be filled with the spirit. Be filled with the spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's a story of a youth pastor uh, who started a Bible study one evening with his youth group. And he asked them, he said, what do you think about the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? Tell me what you believe about the Holy Spirit. They were trying to get them to define the nature or the being of the Holy Spirit. See, and I, I, I will prerequisite this with the fact that it's a little bit hard to pin down the Holy Spirit. He's a spirit, right? Uh, in, in the old days, they called him the Holy Ghost. That makes it even a little more uh, struggling. And so one of the kids spoke up in the midst of that youth service and said, well, he's a little bit like the Wizard of Oz, you know. He's like this emanating being of power, but he's, he's shrouded by some type of curtain. And uh, the, at that moment, the youth pastor's jaw just kind of dropped, and he's like, uh, I don't know about this. And then another one said, well, the Holy Spirit's like, the, uh, like uh, Casper, the friendly ghost. You know, that's the Holy Spirit. He's just kind of this, you know, creeping around, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but he's good. He's a, he's a good guy. He's a friend, you know. Yeah. And uh, at that moment, the youth pastor was aiming, unable to recover the entire night uh, as this kind of um, misnomering of the Holy Spirit began to unfold. And I will be honest with you that no matter your theological predisposition that you entered in here today with, uh, I think we're all much more familiar with the Holy Spirit than we give credit you know, the Holy Spirit's the one that convicts you of sin. The Holy Spirit's the one that's constantly like beckoning you. You know, go do this, don't do this. You know, say this, don't say that. The one that when you first met Jesus, as we like to term that, it was the Holy Spirit that introduced you to Jesus, by the way. Nobody comes to the Father except through the Son. Nobody comes to the Son except being drawn by the Holy Spirit is what Scripture says. So if you've ever met Jesus before, it was the Holy Spirit that was... You know, holding hands and shaking you together, if you will. And so we realize that this is this moment where the spirit and the spiritual nature of both good and evil converges. And we find Jesus in the midst of our evil inside our hearts. The goodness of God is drawing us, creating with us, making us good. To further his ambiguous nature, the Holy Spirit seems to change shape. I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but on multiple occasions in the scriptures, we see the Holy Spirit manifest in different forms. Water, oil, breath, and wind, and fire. All these images are, are shapeable, are moldable. Meaning this, that I think that, that God wants to fill everybody, all of humanity. It doesn't matter what you do in life. doesn't matter uh, your job. doesn't matter your profession. Uh, the Holy Spirit wants to fill you just as much as any preacher, just as much as any pastor, just as a priest, or anybody else. doesn't matter if you work at Walmart. doesn't matter if you're a factory worker. doesn't matter if you're a teacher. doesn't matter if you're an engineer. The Holy Spirit wants to fill you. And he is shapeable and moldable enough that you can do your job as an electrician just as good as any preacher can do their job because you're both filled with the Holy Spirit. And you can do the electrician work just as spirit-filled as you could do preaching. Does that make sense? Anything you do, whatever it may be, lay in bricks, you can do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that with all my heart. That's why I believe the Spirit is, in some ways, the jack of all trades, the Holy Spirit is. One of the most demonstrative views of the Holy Spirit we see is that he hovers over the waters, the formlessness of the earth in the beginning of time, right? And he's overshadowing. And then all of a sudden the Spirit begins to create. And then we hear the same sort of uh, nomenclature in the book of Luke is the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary. The Holy Spirit's at it again. He's going to create this way, time, and this way. And Jesus, he's going to create the path to salvation. And if we are going to have a culture of goodness, then it must be the spirit who is creating that culture here. And I, and I think at the end of the day, we can talk about a culture of goodness all we want to. We can talk about the contrast between what the world is. And how it's going to hell in a handbasket and all the things that are happening in the world at this moment. 
We can talk about the contrast between what the church should be and what the world is. But if we are ever going to have a culture of goodness and New Harvest Assembly of God, it's because the Holy Spirit was overshadowing us and creating that culture here. Yes, sir. You can't force it. You can't make it happen. I can't make you be good. I have children. I realize that. You know what I'm saying? Like, it just doesn't work that way. But I believe that as we create a culture of goodness through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, things can change. And perhaps one of the most important parts of the creative nature is to understand that the Holy Spirit is the one who helps generate and create communication in you with God himself. Here is this idea that to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be filled with communication with God, to be filled with prayer. Paul said in Ephesians 6, 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and all requests. In the book of Acts, we see when somebody gets baptized with the Holy Spirit, they start praying. So the necessary work of the Holy Spirit is to draw you into a more intimate communion with God, and that's done through communication. It's very interesting to me. Um, one of the things that I've learned, I have three boys and one girl. I know I put up five fingers, but anyway, you know what I'm saying. Three boys and one girl. And one girl in the middle. And uh, I realized this over time. That with the boys, you know, you just give them a hug every now and then, and they're generally okay. You know what I'm saying? You just pat them on the back. You tell them they did a good job. You did a good job cutting the grass. Good job weed eating. Good job breaking whatever that was. You know, it doesn't matter. It just, they're all right. You know, they're generally okay. With the girl, it's different. And not, like I said, I only have one, but I realized that my mom, uh, as she shook her head and wrung her hands, she said, girls are just different. I remember that when she was talking about my sister. And I still think she's different. But anyway, uh, <laughs> siblings, you know. But with Whitney, I know that uh, I can do lots of things for her. You know, uh, I can fix her little four-wheeler, which I do on a regular basis. I can take her fishing. I can give her plenty of hugs and kisses and things like that. But for that connection to be really and truly intimate with my daughter, I realize is that it grounds itself in communication. Yeah. One day she grabbed me and she said, Dad, come over here. We need to talk. You know? <laughs> I was scared at that moment. You know what I mean? I, was, I didn't know what was – I didn't – it was just, and I realized at that moment, and, and, and I realized that some ways I'm stereotypifying the Holy Spirit to say that he's, he's more feminine than he is masculine. But th there's a truth to that, that the Holy Spirit is a, a spirit. He's neither male nor female. We realize that. But he has this nature of intimate communication. And I finally realized over much time that both with my wife and my daughter that intimacy is involved with communication. It's about communication. When I communicate well, or when we communicate well, then there's a greater intimacy there. And the Holy Spirit has this, this level of impact in our lives that he's the one that's drawing us into this intimate communication with himself. And the Holy Spirit's like, come on. It's time, it's time to talk. We need to sit down. Let's go. And if you're confused about the nature or the working of the Holy Spirit, then you realize now that it's the Holy Spirit who's drawing you and generating in you prayer. It's welling up within you. It's just those moments where you just have to pray. And this is the elemental part of our understanding of the Holy Spirit explicitly in Ephesians chapter 5. It says, be filled with the Holy Spirit speaking, communicating, praying to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We, uh, I love what Ryan said about his wife. No, don't ask me. I'm just going to say it anyway, right? Okay. Ryan said about Kim, I feel like my gift of the Holy Spirit is singing. You know, I think we all should have that. Some level of speaking to one another, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father. For everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, think about Zechariah. Zechariah sang when he was filled with the Holy Spirit in the book of Luke, Acts chapter two, I mean Luke, Luke chapter 2. Think about Mary. When Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and Jesus is indwell, literally indwelling her, filling her body, filling her empty womb. What happens? 
Mary sang. Yes, sir. And I think if we apply this to a culture of goodness, that when the Holy Spirit comes upon a church and creates a culture of goodness, now we begin to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We begin to spiritualize the communication we have with one another. And all of a sudden, the culture of goodness wells up within itself, and we know how to deal with each other because we're dealing with each other like Jesus Christ would deal with one another. Yes. Philippians chapter 2. Remember, in your relationships with one another, be as the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is forming you, baptizing you, filling you so that you look more like Jesus, act more like Jesus, talk to one another more like Jesus. And those are the things that this church will found itself upon if we're ever going to have a culture of goodness. And the results of being filled with the Holy Spirit are evident in that you communicate with one another through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit and also communicate from the heart of God. Communicating with the Spirit with thankfulness. I think this brings about the idea of the indwelling nature of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a member of the Trinity, and he's dwelling inside you, driving you to communicate with God and to one another. I've, anybody had a chest x-ray before? You, you've had your checks, chest scanned. and uh, The truth is, is that when they did that chest x-ray on me, they didn't find the Holy Spirit in there. Uh, <laughs> but that's because he's a spirit. He's not a man like Jesus. Yeah, sure. He's <laughs> But his nature is to work inside us in an unseen agent to cause us to change into the image of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the active agent who introduces you to Jesus, then indwells you. And at that introduction, he keeps you seeking Christ more and more every day until you fall madly in love with Jesus Christ. And it's this way that he's kind of a spiritual matchmaker. I don't know if anybody's seen this before, but it's called the Babylon Bee. Anybody love the Babylon Bee? All right, Christian satire. If you want to laugh, if you want to be a little bit goofy in Christianity, that's where you need to go, babylonbee.com or whatever it is. There is some funny stuff out there. But one of them was an article that I read recently, and it was great. It was a new dating app that was made for Christian women, women only. You know? and, the, and the Christian dating app was is that you download it to your phone, this is satire. Remember, it's a, just a joke, all right? You put in all your interests and personality traits, how many kids you want to have, what kind of house you want, and then, uh, and then all of a sudden there up paps this you know, thing. We've got a 100% perfect match for you. And there you open up the message, and up pops a picture of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Everybody gets the same match. And in that way, that's the truth of the Holy Spirit, that he is this spiritual matchmaker, that he's trying to constantly get you to engage Jesus Christ, to engage the Father, to learn who he is, to tell you who he is. He has matched you in perfect relationship and is trying to help you follow in love with Jesus more and more every day. When we hear this echoed in the scriptures, you must pay careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. Be very careful, then, how you live. Remember in your relationships to be as Jesus Christ. How do we live like Jesus? What we do, what we pay attention to, what we have heard, what we have heard of Jesus and the Holy Spirit is this agent inside of you, constantly generating prayer in you so that you can pray more fervently and effectively. The more clearly you see Jesus, the better you can communicate with the Lord and with each other. And if there's anything I believe that we desperately need in this day and age, it's a better form of communication with each other. Every day, the world becomes increasingly more polarized. Have you noticed that there are people that are so immature and like I've said this before, in the 1970s, there was a clinical psychologist named Murray Bowen who actually pioneered the theory of Bowen family systems theory. I'm a, I consider myself a family systems theorist. Anyway, he, he pioneered this. I think he prophesied is what I'm going to say. 
I think he prophesied and he said, in about 30 to 40 years, the people in the United States will become so emotionally immature that they won't even be able to talk to each other. Yes. That's the world we live in. That if you have a political ideology that differs from this person over here on that side of the aisle or from this side of the aisle, all of a sudden we can't even have a conversation anymore. Why? Because they're so emotionally immature that they can't even talk to somebody that's got a differing view. Yeah. That's called Facebook, <laughs> Instagram. And my Lord, you post anything that, that says you have clearly made a decision on anything on social media, and five people are crying in their bedroom looking at the picture on, that you posted. You know what I'm saying? Like something's wrong. Something's deeply wrong with our society. That we become so emotionally immature, we can't even talk to each other. Can't even have a conversation. And yet, maturity is often defined as somebody that's able to have engaging conversation with people that have differing views. And that's okay. It's okay to talk to people. It's okay to talk to people that aren't like you, that don't walk like you, that don't talk like you, don't dress like you, and don't have the same political views. How are you ever going to reach anybody for Jesus if you can't? And I'm just wondering that in my head. We need to learn to communicate with each other. And I believe that the moving of the Holy Spirit upon us in a greater way, creating a culture of goodness, will bring us to the point where we can be emotionally mature enough to have conversations with each other. How are you going to reach lost people if you can't have a conversation? I'm just, I'm just fleshing this out in my mind. And so the Holy Spirit is in us. And he's constantly creating prayer in you so that you can more fervently and effectively communicate with one another. So if this is true about the Holy Spirit and that you cannot talk about him unless you talk about fullness. I mean, read the scriptures. Read the book of Luke. I, I, I promise you, do this. Read the book of Luke and underline it every time you see somebody gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke acts. It's what it's all about. Be full of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter what, where you're from. It doesn't matter what your, it doesn't even matter what your, um, your religious predisposition or tradition has been. Whether you're Pentecostal or non-Pentecostal, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Is what I'm saying. Just be filled with Him. <clears throat> Nearly everybody in the Book of Luke Acts gets filled with the Holy Spirit, and every once in a while, we realize that our kids will come to us with a question. You know, one of those questions that you're not really sure how to answer. Anybody remember this or deal with this? I deal with it on a regular basis. I've got four kids, and they're all young, and they're all asking questions all the time. <laughs> and, and it's my own fault. I realize that because I asked tons of questions when I was a kid. Um, I, I remember I had a neighbor that picked us up from school for a while, and she took us home. And I, I get, it was my turn to sit in the front seat of her big conversion van. And, and there's tons of kids in the back, and I'm just, I don't, I don't know, just one of those things. I'm a, I'm a little bit different, I guess, but uh, I, looked at, I looked at it, my neighbor's mom, and, and I looked at her and I said, you know, when radio waves are transmitted to a television, how does it break it down and turn it back into the image that it came from? And she looks at me like, what's wrong with this? I was in middle school, you know what I mean? Like, what's, yes, sir, yes, sir. what is going on in this kid's brain? She didn't answer the question either, by the way. <laughs> she, she just kind of looked at me funny. And I'm sure she had a conversation with my mom later on. Like, I don't know what Scott's thinking, but it's, it's not a normal kid's thinking. But uh, yes, sir. anyway, our kids come to us and they ask us questions that are hard to answer. You know, where do babies come from? William looked at me one day as we left the neighborhood and said, why is that dog riding piggyback on that other dog? And I, it's just like, Wesley, why, several years ago, Wesley saw a, a Budweiser truck unloading at a gas station, you know. And he goes, wait, what's that guy doing with all that stuff he's unloading over there? And it was, I mean, he was young enough that it was like an awkward conversation with me. I said, well, he's, he's unloading beer from that truck. And I'm a teetotaler, you know. Uh, I grew up in a family that uh, my dad was a functioning alcoholic, and so yes, I, uh, it's hard for me to have that conversation. 
but anyway, um, I said, he's unloading beer. He goes, of course. The next question, a follow-up question, Dad, what's beer? Well, I said, beer is a substance that uh, when you drink enough of it, it will intoxicate your body. I don't know. I'm with for the technical explanation, I suppose. And I said, if it raises your blood alcohol uh, level far enough, then you become intoxicated. And everything that you do from that point on is influenced by the toxic liquid that's inside of you. Now, if you think that, I, that the technical explanation wasn't the best explanation, let me tell you that that's what Paul did in Ephesians. Be not drunk with wine, but be intoxicated with the Holy Spirit. Don't be intoxicated with a substance, but be intoxicated with the Holy Spirit. Because we know by scientific evidence and by probably some of the parties that you went to when you were younger, that when people are intoxicated with any given substance, that the control of their activities, the words and communication of their mouth suddenly become a bit a slurred and a bit toxic also. It's not just their blood alcohol levels that are toxified, but now the words that are leaving their mouth are dripping with toxic substance. And so Paul takes that line of communication. Do not be drunk with wine. Rather, be filled with the Holy Spirit so that when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are under the total influence of the Holy Spirit. So when the words leave your mouth, they're dripping with the substance of the Spirit and not with the substance of the flesh. When you do, when you walk, when you say, when you speak, when you act, suddenly I'm under the influence of the spirit, not under the influence of the flesh. That's the reasoning of Paul. That was my reasoning in communicative efforts to realize that we need now more than ever as we communicate, as we offer ourselves with songs, hymns, and Spiritual songs that we're not communicating in the flesh, we're communicating in the spirit. And the spirit is the defining factor of the spirit's work. A few years ago, uh, we went hiking with some friends, and there were seven kids, three adult, or four adults, seven kids and four, four adults. Three of the kids had to be carried basically the entire time we went hiking. It's one of those deals, you know couple mile trip it wasn't all that bad but three of the kids just couldn't make it and it was my friend and I couldn't I was trying to deal with all the names of his kids he had three boys and um, the only one that I probably still remember only to this day is Dominic he and when he when he told me his name was Dominic he looked at me and he said he told me the etymology of his name he says Dominic is Latin for the word dominion which means basically that God owns everything or in his case, his name was Dominic, it means belongs to God, that I belong to God. And this is, I think, essentially what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. He's putting a stamp on every square inch of your life saying, it's mine. I have dominion over it. There's a story, worship team, you can come. Um, there's a story of a pastor he was very well educated and knew what he believed in his theology uh, very well when it pertained to the Holy Spirit. And there was this elderly lady in the church that uh, made one of those comments that says, you know, I'm praying for you, Pastor. Well, as years went on, he finally just kind of got annoyed because every time he'd see her out in the community, at church, every church service, I'm praying for you. And after a while, he discerned that, man, she's praying for something specific. It's not just like a general prayer, like that you do well or that everything's okay. But she, he began to realize that she had some ulterior motives, like I'm praying for you, pastor. You know, one of those sort of things. And, and finally, kind of realizing her theological disposition and his, he said, you're praying that I be filled with the Holy Spirit, aren't you? And she said, yes, that's exactly what I'm praying that would happen. In your life. And the pastor said, Well, you know, at conversion, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. Blah, blah, blah. And he just goes on, rattles off his normal theological argument. And then she looks at him and he says, You know, I'm glad you're filled with the Holy Spirit. 
I'm glad the Holy Spirit has you. And as she said that, he stopped in his tracks. Because he would constantly say, I have the Holy Spirit. I have the Holy Spirit. And then her reversing of that terminology stopped him. But does the Holy Spirit have you? And here comes the issue of possession. Is it that you have the Holy Spirit? Are you in control? Or is it the Holy Spirit has you? Because I believe if we're reading Paul correctly, be not filled with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The metaphor has to go the route of possession. The route of that the Holy Spirit is the one controlling things in my life. It's not me. Have you ever felt this way? Compulsive by the Spirit? But you, you didn't have, you couldn't control your, like you had to say what you were going to say. You had to do what you were going to do. Maybe it was just an extra tip at a restaurant. Maybe it was deeper than that. Maybe it was much deeper than that, that you were actually thinking in the power of the Holy Spirit. On multiple occasions in my life, there's been moments where the Holy Spirit possessed me to the point that it really wasn't even me working. It was Christ in me, the hope of glory. Glory. Christ in me doing. I know we probably are uncomfortable with that terminology, possessed. The Spirit possessed me. But that's the truth of what is happening here. We were on the Kentucky River. We pulled the boat up onto the bank. All the kids are out playing. Whitney took off her life jacket on the beach. All of a sudden, I didn't see her, and in my spirit, I heard, where's Whitney? I walked around the other side of the boat, and there she was. In about two seconds, she would have gone under the water. I grabbed her out. She didn't even have a breath full of water in her lungs. All I did was pay attention. Where's Whitney? That's what I heard. Where's Whitney? I heard it in my spirit. That was the Holy Spirit. On multiple occasions, this has happened. When I lived in Florida, I walked up the back of the gymnasium. There's a storage area in the back of the church. There's an outside stairwell. I was looking earlier that day with church linens that somebody had put in trash bags, and of course they got thrown away. But I said, they're not there. Went back to the office, told the pastor. The pastor said, "Go, let's go look again. So I, I, I looked pretty good. I wouldn't have gone. But we felt compelled that day. I walked up the back of the stairwell. I turned around to say something to the pastor who was down at the bottom of the stairwell. I looked over the back side of the fence because it's a two-story gymnasium. Looked over the back side of the fence to the neighbor's yard. And there he was hanging by his neck in the backyard. Looked at the pastor and said, Glenn hung himself. I knew the neighbor. I ran around to the other side, kicked down the fence that he had blocked up, got inside, and I thought he was gone. One of the most gruesome things I've ever seen in my entire life. And all of a sudden, I heard him take a deep breath. He was still alive. That morning, I would have normally not taking my knife with me because I normally on Wednesday, I know it was a Wednesday morning. Normally I go to the middle school and I mentor at the middle school. I decided that morning I wasn't going to go to the middle school. I was tired, sleepy, whatever. Maybe the Holy Spirit moved upon me. Maybe the Spirit possessed me and that's the reason that I took, didn't go to the school and I took my knife with me that morning, put it in my pocket. I had my knife with me. I cut him down. He fell like a sack of potatoes. Called 911. Got him ready for CPR. By that time, the paramedics showed up. The man had zero brain damage after he hung himself in the backyard. Why? Maybe at that moment, the spirit was just working. Maybe at that moment, 
the Spirit was working in me for the right cause at the right time in the right place. And the Spirit positioned me just for that reason. So as we approach this idea, or rather finalize this idea of a culture of goodness, does the Holy Spirit have you? Or do you have the Holy Spirit? Are you allowing the spirit freedom in your life to change you and mold you and shape you into the image of Jesus Christ? Are you allowing the spirit to season your communication so that it comes out like a song? That when you speak to one another, it's not offensive speech, but it has melody to it. And I think this is the ultimate question. Because you can rebuke people, you can correct people, you can tell people to their face that they're wrong. If you do it the right way, they won't be offended. Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us and refill us again so that he's the one who has dominion in our lives? And so if I will, to bring it all to conclusion, it's this. If we want a culture of goodness anywhere, in your workplace, in your family life, in this church, then you've got to let the Spirit fill your life. Ultimately, for this reason, so that when people reflect on New Harvest Assembly of God, they'll stop and they'll say, ah, with this group right there, we know them because they're the ones that really follow Jesus. (laughs) Man, they're just like Jesus. I lived in Florida for almost nine years. We performed over 60 different funerals in nine years' time. They call Florida God's waiting room for a reason. But anyway, there's a lot going on down there. And often I would hear it over and over again when people approached the casket at the front of the church or at the funeral home. They'd make these odd paradoxical comments like, man, they look so good. I'm thinking, you know, if it, there's a day that you don't have to look like yourself, it's, it's that day. You know what I'm saying? All to some hairdresser or some funeral director's ability as they look down in the casket that you're supposed to have this face looking back up at you that looks like themselves. And it's always been my prayer since I've heard that reiterated in a multiple and a myriad of ways with different people. That when I'm dead and I'm laying in a casket on my back looking up and people walk by, I pray that they wouldn't say, wow, he looks like Scott. I pray that they look down at me and they say, man, he looks like Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's why we're here. That's why we're gathered together. So we can look more like Jesus. If we are ever going to have a culture of goodness, it's time to look more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you this morning. Lord, we thank you for your goodness towards us. We thank you that you are, maybe slowly and over time, creating a culture of goodness in us and through us. Lord, I pray that today would just be the inauguration of such a culture. Lord, as we get ready to sing about your goodness in just a few moments, I pray that you would be overwhelmingly present in us and through us. Possess us, Holy Spirit. Do your will in us. Even when we would fail to do it, even when we would fail to be motivated to pray or to communicate or communicate in the Spirit with one another, Lord, I pray that your hand would be upon us and you would cause us anyway. That's the yielding we need in our lives. To just say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be accomplished. The only way that we can pray that prayer, Lord, is by the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, in our flesh, we pray, let this cup pass from me. But in the Spirit, we pray, not my will, but thy will. The old psalm says, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. And that is our prayer this morning. Have thine own way in me, Lord. 
Pray that with me. Have thine own way in me, Lord. Have thine own way at New Harvest, Lord. Have thine own way in my family, Lord. Have thine own way in my work and the fruit of my hands, Lord. In Jesus' name. And the church said together, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord this morning. Sing about the goodness of God. Scott said, may our lives be a reflection of Christ. Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you for this church family. And uh, we just ask that you go walk with us today. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Now this afternoon, we're going to do our absolute best as we get ready to dedicate the uh, pavilion. I almost said temple. But anyway, (laughs) we get ready to dedicate the pavilion uh, this afternoon 
Uh, the sun is shining right now. I'm praying that that continues to hold. Uh, but uh, from 3 to 5, we will do Acts of Harvest, share a meal together. The community will be able to come, and we're going to share this meal together as we celebrate together the dedication of the pavilion. We'll also have groceries that they take home. It's kind of normal in that way. If the weather is bad, we'll go have it in the youth room over here. Uh, either way, we're still doing everything. So if you would like to come set up, 2 o'clock, Mark will be here to kind of lead you in what we're doing. Um, and then at 3 o'clock, we'll have a meal together up in the pavilion, hoping, praying that we'll have a meal together up there. And uh, we'll have a great time of fellowship. We'll dedicate and pray over the pavilion. It's going to be a great time. And I uh, uh, please bring us side if you can uh, so that you can share it. We have... I don't know, 100 pieces of chicken. So come ready for fried chicken this afternoon, all right? Anybody ready for fried chicken? I hope there's a lot of chicken. So uh, we'll see you this afternoon. Be blessed. If you have any questions, I'll be around. Uh, but have a wonderful uh, day in the Lord today. Have thine own way, Lord.